Hi everyone, today we're going to be looking at some of the sustainability principles which are the sort of the foundations of the Peace Pods project. Peace Pods is looking to design a number of open source blueprints um, to help people set up sustainable public services within their community. So rather than relying on governments to do it all for us, we think we can do it much better ourselves, a lot cheaper and much more sustainably. We're going to take a look at a number of factors um, for the product's life cycle of the various things and see how, how they're affected by either a money-based economy or a resource-based economy. I'm going to use on, on this slide a toothbrush as an example. Uh, if you're listening to this presentation on Spreaker or SoundCloud or something like that, the, the audio only version, I've also got a YouTube video that's, that's got a slideshow with it, so take a look in the description to get the link to that. So let's take production as the first factor. In a money based economy, your driving force is all about how do I make more money? So you want to increase production. The more you sell, the more money you make and you've achieved your goal. So you start coming up with all sorts of gimmicks, you know, for the toothbrush, you can have all these rubber handles and make it battery powered and have the nozzle vibrate and things like that. Uh, anything you can to encourage people to buy your toothbrush regardless of any sort of environmental impacts or what resources you're going to use. In a resource-based economy, however, you want to do the exact opposite. You want to reduce the amount of resources that go into a product and the amount of energy and the amount of time and effort and transport and, and things like this. So you can already start to see a stark contrast between how things are done in a money-based economy, um, which is basically most of what we've got in existence today is, is along the money paradigm, and what we do in a resource-based economy. In a money-based economy, the, there's really no consideration about what's going into a product or how it's used in terms of the resource usage. It's all about the money. It's, it's as if money is the most important thing in existence, but it's not. We're on a planet with finite resources. We can't just use up all of those resources and then have none left, you know. So we've got to really start transitioning to somewhere where it's the resources that are the most important thing and specifically making the best use of them and harming the planet as little as possible. Next up we've got longevity. Well of course in a money based economy you, you, you want to keep s selling stuff so ideally in the case of a toothbrush you want someone to throw it away <laughs> uh, because then they're going to buy a new one. So you plan obsolescence into the product, you know, make sure it's not going to last as long as it could do. You, you want it to become obsolete or useless as quickly as possible within reason so that someone comes back and buys another one for another one from you. Um, and even if you wanted to allow a product to be sold to someone else, you need a barrier there. You need, you, you need to make that the painful option because it's not good for you as a producer. If, if people start selling your product, it means you're selling less of that product to your customers. Um, so that there needs to be barriers there to, to make it a lot more comfortable for people to simply throw things away and get rid of them. And then they'll come back and buy more. In a resource-based economy, the whole point is to make things as reusable as possible. So I'll be showing some other examples of, of this later in the presentation. Um, in the case of a, a bamboo toothbrush, it doesn't have a battery that runs out. Um, and even if the bristles become frayed, 
you've still got a piece of wood there that you can turn into something else. Next up we'll take a look at refurbishment. Well again in a money based economy you you might want to repair things, you know, something like a car or a house, you, you make them repairable to some degree. But the ideal is to have them just simply discarded, because then that drives consumerism. Um, in a resource-based economy, the first thing you want to try and do is make it as repairable as possible, as, as the primary solution because you, you want things to last as long as possible you want to be able to reuse them for as long as possible and if it can't be repaired then you want to say for example make sure it's very easy to recycle so if you take the the plastic toothbrush from the monetary economy that's not very recyclable recyclable <laughs> you you know the, the plastics don't really biodegrade so you've got to have some harmful chemical process to try and turn them from a plastic toothbrush into some material that you can use again. It's got a battery in, in the case of the electric toothbrush, that again, not trivial to recycle. And all these harmful chemicals. Whereas the bamboo toothbrush, if you were to recycle that, you could just throw it in the ground and it'll turn back into soil. It'll biodegrade quite happily. It's just wood. Next up, and I struggle to think of a correct word for this, but I'll, I'll call it conversion. And this is the idea of, before we recycle something, or, you know, before we throw it away or recycle it, can we turn it into something else? So it might no longer fulfil its original use, but is there some easy way that we can craft it into some other product? And of course, in the monetary-based economy, you don't want any of that. You just want people to throw it away. Again, you'll see this coming up over and over again. Throw it away, get rid of it, because then you'll buy a new one. In the resource-based economy, everything is designed to maximise the potential to repurpose it into something else. Of course, you can't really do these sorts of things. You know, repair, recycle, repurpose is very expensive in a monetary based economy because it's all about the money but in a resource based economy where it's all about the resources these things repair recycle repurpose suddenly become much more appealing and you know it becomes the norm to take better care of the the resources and the products that have been made from those resources we then got reclamation and again <laughs> Um, th this is if you've got a big pile of, of waste somewhere, for example. So in a money-based economy, just you know, landfill, discard it, get rid of it. Maybe try and recycle some stuff. But generally, you, you, your ideal is to just throw it away uh, because that's the cheapest thing to do. In a resource-based economy, you definitely want to make things recyclable. You don't want stuff going into landfill. And the reason for that is if we look at the disposal factor, in a monetary-based economy, the absolute ideal is to commit ecocide, which is basically, you know, destroy the planet for profit. So not only are you you're trying to, you know, harvest minerals from the planet at an ever-increasing rate and then make sure whatever you make with those things is predominantly just thrown away as landfill or chucked into the ocean or pumped into the air, any, any conceivable way possible, whatever's cheapest to pollute the land and make it less livable. So you, you, you're killing the land. That, that's the, the real driving force behind a monetary-based economy because it's the cheapest thing to do. In a resource-based economy, however... If, if you've got resources, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to just get rid of them. You don't want pollution. You don't want to start running out of the natural supplies of resources. So even if you've not yet been able to repair, recycle or repurpose a product, as a last resort, what you'd be looking to do is store the waste, the things that you, you can't yet find a, a good way to 
to bring back into the um, sort of like market cycle or whatever. So you could store them and find a better use for them later or you could recover them. And I'll be showing some examples of these later in the presentation. And so ultimately, if we look at the progress of society, there's a very stark contrast. In a money-based economy, you want to really inhibit progress because progress costs money. And, and you know that, that comes out of your profits. So the only time the progress is enabled is if it's going to make someone more money, um, which is usually causing all of these adverse side effects like, you know, throwing things away and the eco side and just general terrible uh, management of the planet. Um, but also if you have a, say, a good idea, you know, you find a better way to do something, in a money-based economy, you patent it or you copyright it and things like that, it makes it harder for other people to reuse. So someone might have a brilliant idea of, you know, free energy, for example. That would be a nightmare in a money-based economy. Um, first of all, someone would patent it and look to make it very expensive for anyone who wanted to use that idea. But then governments would come along and say, oh, no, this is going to affect all of the energy industry. We can't have free energy. You know, it's, it's bad for business. <laughs> um, so it's, there's this crazy inhibition of... Uh, the, the sort of pro progress is, is bad, basically. It's frowned upon. It, it harms the money-making machine. Whereas in a resource-based economy, you want the complete opposite. You want to encourage progress of any kind. You know, if you can find a way to use less resources, if you find a way to make stuff free or, you know, automate things, um, if you can find a way to not need people to be slaving away in a job all day, it's, it's the complete sort of flip side, really, of a money-based economy. And one of the key things that the Peace Pods project's aiming to do is, on the one hand, accept that we're in a money-based economy currently and that we want to go to a resource-based economy, but you can't just flick a switch and make that happen. You know, it, it, it is such a huge change. It's literally the complete opposite of a money-based economy. So what we're looking to do is say, within a money-based economy, are there ways of setting up little bits of a resource-based economy within the current system so that, that we can start doing some of these good things today rather than waiting forever? You know, we're never going to get this silver bullet that just changes everything overnight. So what can we do today? So let's take a, a look at how all these things inter interrelate with each other. And I'm going to start with reduce. This is really, really important. If you make less stuff, you've got less waste, you've got, you know, you're using less energy. It, it just, from a resource perspective, reducing how much you produce is, is the golden rule. You know, it affects everything else. And what might seem strange initially as an example of this is a, a group called Growing Power. And they're based in the United States. And I'll, I'll just read the caption on this image. I grew a million pounds of food on just a few acres in the dead of winter without heating. Will Allen, urban farmer. So that doesn't sound like reduce. I mean, it's, you know, he's obviously producing a lot more stuff. Um... So I'll get to where the reduction comes in shortly. First, what do we mean by an urban farm? It's basically by the side of a dual carriageway, he's got this plot of land, three acres, and he's just... I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but he's kind of cobbled together buildings out of, you know, he's built them out of wood and bits of plastic sheeting and stuff like that. It's, it's not... It doesn't require super high tech to achieve this kind of thing. You can use it with the stuff that you've, you've got readily available already. So on this three acre plot of land, he's made a million pounds of food, 
and also 10,000 fish per year. And he can do this all year round. It, it's, un, it's undercover, so it doesn't really matter what the weather's like. The way he achieves this is, first of all, he uses vertical farming. So if you've got an acre of land, normally you can only grow an acre of food on that. Vertical farming says, well, actually, go upwards instead of outwards. So you could have, say, three acres of land, of food growing on one acre of land. He uses aquaponics, which is where you have a big fish tank. That's where your 10,000 fish come from. And the primary purpose of these fish isn't so much for food, although they do go on to become food, but it's to create nutrient-rich water. That then gets poured over the plants, means you don't need fertiliser and stuff like that. And the stuff that comes off the plants goes back into the fish tank to feed the fish. The other thing that he does is he composts, so any plant waste and, and other stuff like that gets composted within these buildings and that provides the heat. That's how he can grow stuff in the dead of winter. So what, what reduced here? Among other things, he's using less land, less pesticides, because you're not getting pests coming into the, the indoor farm, less herbicides, because, wind, because weeds aren't grow, uh, blowing into the indoor farm, less fertiliser, that's what the fish are for, they produce fertiliser for free, less heating and the composting, less topsoil erosion, because again, the composting. So on the one hand, he's increased production, but on the other hand, he's decreased all of the, the sort of wasteful aspects of producing food. So it's a, a really good example that really you can do anywhere. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. Next up, we're gonna look at reuse. Well, obviously this is a a key way to reduce production as well. So if I've got, say, a lawnmower, I'm only gonna use it a few times a year. All the time it's not being used, if I let someone else use it, they now don't need to buy a lawnmower. So you, you've got this feedback loop already starting to appear between the various elements of sustainability. And a great example of this is FreeCycle. So if you go to freecycle.org, you get a little box where you type in uh, the nearest major city to you and that'll find your local recy free cycling group. And then you either say what sort of things you're looking for or what you have to offer. And it's a gift economy. So essentially people, when they've finished using something, say they're, they're buying some new furniture, rather than just skipping the old furniture, you know, throwing it in the trash, give it away to someone for free. You know, there's going to be someone out there that's just moved into a house or a student or something like that that needs furniture and they'll happily take yours. So it's less effort for you because they come and collect it. You know, they'll turn up in the car and, and take your furniture away, <laughs> making space for your new furniture. And... The opposite is true. So people say, oh, I'm looking for these kind of things. Does anyone have it? And it's like, oh, yeah, I've got some of that in the loft. I'll, you can have it. So this sets up a gift economy. It means that the things that exist already, rather than just getting thrown away, go on to someone else who will keep using them. Next up, we're going to look at repair. And I couldn't resist this one. Um, in the UK, there's a, a TV show called Top Gear. It's all about cars and stuff and and they have the usual things you know all the the super the super fast cars and lamborghinis and all this kind of stuff but they do some crazy things on there as well and one of them was regarding a, to a toyota hilux van and this is the sort of thing if you ever watch the news when they're doing reports from wars in far off lands you always see the blokes in the back of these things with the guns and they all always look like really badly damaged but it makes you think it's in a war zone why are they driving around in a toyota and so top gear set out to find out why they set fire to it they put it on top of a block of flats and then demolished the block of flats so it was basically a building demolition came came down on top of it 
They dropped caravans on it, they hit it with wrecking balls, they dunked it in the River Thames, like sank it in the River Thames. All kinds of things, all, all sorts of different ways to try and destroy this vehicle. And as you can imagine, at the end of this, it did look like a complete wreck. But after each one of these experiments they did, all it took was a bloke with a box of tools, and he was able to get it working again. It didn't need any sort of specialist tools, you know, it was just using wrenches and hammers and spanners and, and things like that. But it, it, it proved almost impossible to kill this vehicle, even though it was damaged beyond comprehension. It still worked. They could still get in it and drive it. So it's a great example of, you know, if you build something the right way, even under extreme damage, it can still work if you've designed it properly. Next up, we're going to look at repurposing. So this is where you, like I mentioned earlier, you take something that already exists and find a new use for it, something it might not have originally been designed for. And this is commonly referred to, at least on the internet, as upcycling. Um, if you just Google upcycle, you'll find loads of examples of this. So there's things like taking old tyres and a few bits of wood and some grass, turning them into seating in a park. Or you might take an old ladder and turn it into a bookshelf. Um, there's even examples where they've taken the cargo containers and turned them into housing because they're built to be waterproof and rigid and uh, it's quite easy to take one of those and make housing out of them. And recently in the, uh, the Turkish uprising, um, they, there was a lot of police firing CS gas at protesters and they found a really nice way of taking what was actually sort of like quite a depressing thing, a CS gas canister, it's basically chemical weapons that the police use, um, and using them as plant pots. So it's, you know, it's, it made it very positive, um, what was otherwise a, a quite depressing piece of stuff. So there's all kinds of ways to upcycle. And again, this means that the resources you've used, rather than just throwing them away, always look to make them last longer, turn them into something else. And and again, all of these things tend to go back into that main reduce principle. It means less stuff has to be produced from the outset if you're reusing and repairing and repurposing what we've already got. The next one is recycling. And these days, especially in... Um, like sustainability or environmentalist groups, a lot of people, when you say recycling, they've trained the brain to think repurpose, which is good. It is good, but the, I really want to make the distinction here between repurposing, which is taking something and sort of retooling it into a, a different product, for example, versus recycling, which is more about taking something and converting it back into raw materials that you can then use to build a completely new thing from scratch. So as an example here, um, I've just seen this one recently, is the Aero robot. And it's basically a robot that recycles concrete. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, a sort of like a, a, a vacuum cleaner <laughs> that has a big suction cup on the end that sucks onto a concrete wall or a concrete floor and then uses all sorts of drills and pressured water and all sorts of other stuff to literally eat away at the concrete and turn it back into this sort of uh, powdered version of concrete that can then be put in these big sacks and used again to, to build new concrete buildings. Now the, the traditional way of doing this, if we think about the monetary economy, you, you wouldn't want all this expense. You just, you know, bulldoze the building, put it all in dumpster trucks, and dump it in landfill. So, you know, you, you're wasting all that concrete. Um, and if you look at most countries that have huge amounts of waste building materials, it's very difficult when you use traditional methods, for example, to get the, the metal reinforcement bars 
out of the concrete because um, obviously that metal could be melted down and turned into something else but with Aero because it's not only stripping the concrete and turning it back into reusable sort of concrete dust if you like but it's freeing up you can actually see all of the metal bars becoming exposed and they can then easily be melted down so it's a, it's a really good example of of the difference we're not turning this sort of concrete building into some other type of you know we're not turning it into a different product as is we're, we're turning it back into its raw materials to be able to build something new from afresh um there will always still be stuff though that like I said earlier, some stuff that we just can't find a way to reuse, repair, repurpose or recycle. And in a resource-based economy, what you really want to do is store that stuff and then find a way to recover it. So this is kind of the the last phase. Obviously, if you're recovering stuff as well, um, there might be a new way to recycle something that wasn't previously recyclable so that I can feed back into recycling. Um, and, but I think a good example of this is a project in New Zealand called Rekindle. And what they do is they harvest wood from demolished buildings. They've had earthquakes, for example, that made a lot of buildings unsafe and those buildings had to be demolished. But they contained a lot of perfectly good, usable hardwood. So they go out and collect this wood. They take it back to a workshop where they machine it and basically turn it into furniture. So it's, it's a great way of, of taking what would have otherwise just been rotting away in a, a landfill site and actually turning it back into something useful. Um, it's sort of like a, a last stage attempt at repurposing something, but only this time we're, we're taking something that's actually gone to landfill or actually considered waste and, and finding a way to make that useful again. So, there's no use doing all these great things if, if you don't replicate it, you know. If I have a brilliant idea and I don't tell anyone, it's not going to make a big impact on the world. I'm just one person out of, what, 6.8 billion people. So, you, you need to be able to share. And a classic example of this is anything that's open source. So you've got things like Wikipedia, which is an open source encyclopedia. Anyone can contribute to it and update it. Anyone can pull information from it and use it for whatever they want, all for free. Uh, you've then got things like GitHub, which is open source uh, software development. So anyone can store the code on this thing for free. They can have other people contribute to it. Anyone can take that code and use it in their own projects. Uh, there's just loads of stuff. If you go and Google open source, you'll, you'll find loads of examples of, of these kind of things. But it's really a reciprocal thing. So it's not just me sharing out there any ideas that I have, but you then need people to be able to find those things and put them to use. And in doing so, they're going to, come up with their own better ways of doing things. Uh, you know, they might spot a problem and see how to fix it, or they might just say, you know, we could actually completely replace this with something else that's going to be much, much better. They need to be able to send that information back to the sort of central source, if you like, and then anyone that's been using the original version of it needs to be able to get updated. You know, oh, we found a better way to do this. So it's a... It's a reciprocal thing. It's, it's really about open collaboration, I think, is perhaps the, the sort of best description of it. Um, not just sharing the idea, but having the people that are using it come back and collaborate to make that idea better, and then making sure that everyone in the world can benefit from that. Again, it's the complete opposite of what you want to do in a money-based economy. Um, in a money-based economy, you, you know, if, you, if you've got a good idea, you want to make sure no one else can use it because that would allow them to compete with you and, and that's dangerous in a, in a money-based economy. Now, th this might be somewhat... Um, <laughs> I'm 
this might cause a few arguments, but I want to just look at the repurpose and recycle phases again. There's a problem here. What happens with scarce resources? If, if you've got resources that are incredibly scarce, you don't want people repurposing them into garden furniture and ornaments and whatever else. And traditionally in sustainability movements, there's this idea that you always do repurposing before recycling. But that's going to make it really hard to recycle scarce resources like rare earth metals and things like that because it's been turned into something else. So I was looking at another project called Rescape and it gave me sort of an idea about, you know, we might want to flip these things around a bit. So just to talk about Rescape, it's a project in, I think it's in LA, or certainly in America, I think it's somewhere around LA. And they do all the usual stuff, so, you know, repurposing, you know, taking bottles and turning them into lanterns and taking a, like a crate of wine or something and turning it into a dog bed. They do all that, but they also obviously deal with recycling. They sort of present themselves and promote themselves as um, sort of clever recycling or innovative recycling, something like that. But that made me think if we flipped around recycle and repurpose, so recycling comes first and it's no longer about, you know, turning everything that you receive at the recycling plant into raw materials. It's about making sure that any rare materials, rare metals or minerals or whatever else, or things that might be harmful to the environment even, get taken out of the, the sort of ecological food chain, so to speak, and turned back into either something that's safe or something that can be you know, used again as a, as a raw resource, and then go on to have any, everything that's not sort of turned back into its component parts would still go on to be repurposed and, and recovered. But the other thing here is that I think you also need feeders from, say if you've got like something like FreeCycle or a tool library, which is all about reusing the, the things we've built out of resources, there needs to be a way of saying, well actually, we're really desperate for this type of metal or chemical or whatever it is, and be able to sort of suck anything that's, that's made of that stuff into a recycling plant. Um, there also needs to be a similar sort of thing from recovery. So if we've got these stores of, of things we've not yet worked out what to do with, um, there needs to be a way of pulling out of there to say, oh, we're desperate for this mineral or whatever, and get stuff from the, the storage of, of waste materials. So ultimately, I think we, we sort of end up with this sort of fairly comprehensive idea about how to tackle sustainability albeit with a, a contentious uh, swapping of recycle and repurpose. But just to remember, the recycling is really becoming focused on just making sure we're able to get the rarest resources back to the start of the food chain again, um, without ha having them going to less than ideal uses. So that's about it for now, I think. Um, if you want to know more, head over to peacepods.org. It's www.peacepods.org. Uh, there's just a temporary holding page up there at the time of doing this presentation. But if you click on the logo, it'll take you to a Facebook group where you can see a bit more information. Um, we're currently sort of setting up websites and wikis and, and other things. But that's it for now. Thanks.